This episode of Geared Up is brought to you by National Car Rental. Take control of your travel experience with National Car Rental's Emerald Club. Visit nationalcar.com to find out more. What do you see happening here? Do you see Disney or Apple overtaking Netflix in the next year or two? Or do you think Netflix kind of sits at the top for a while? I think Apple's strategy is going to be interesting. Obviously, Apple needs to start charging for this at some point. They extend the free trial into the next generation of devices. So whatever iPhone 12s or whatever comes next, I can see them growing significantly. And then as season two of shows start to come out, people get more excited. I don't think they're going to catch Netflix. Who I think might catch Netflix, though, is Disney+. Plus. Mm. Once the Marvel shows start hitting, once season two of Mandalorian comes out, there's so much buzz from season one. Right. I think they have the content, the money, and the chops to be the first company to really give Netflix a run for their money. I think Apple's big problem is no IP, no established properties, right? Right. They're making their own. Servants new. Morning shows new. Everything is new right now. I mean, Disney's right. got Star Wars, Marvel. I mean, they, there's so much Pixar. IP there that they have. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. I am John Rettinger. Geared Up is your weekly look at the latest in tech, gadgets, and games. And John, we need to... You've been actually the most interesting topic for the past <laughs> three weeks or so. For a change, I have something interesting. <laughs> we have to kick off the show with you again. Okay. We were talking last week about your transition, if you will, switching over yes. from the iPhone to Android. Now, what you told everyone last week, though, was that this transition was going to start when you got your Galaxy S20 in your hand, whether it be a review unit or a unit that you ended up buying. Correct. But middle of the week, I go to send you a text and lo and behold, the text is green and not blue. I came so back green. What's going on? I forced you over to Telegram. <laughs> so... Samsung had sent me to unbox one of their special edition Star Wars Note 10 Pluses. Yeah. And I'd kind of forgotten about it. And then I saw the box sitting there calling my name. And I figured mm. ah, that was a good time to start. Maybe I'm not going to get that review unit for a while. I was kind of itching and I was able to use it. And I mean, I didn't have to go buy a Galaxy Fold, which I really wanted to switch to. Right. So I switched over to the Note 10 Plus. I figured it'll give me some good perspective heading into Samsung's Unpacked. On the 11th, about, you know, what what their new One UI 2.0 is like, or I think 2.1 at this point, you know, how they handled Android 10. At least I would have a perspective as to maybe how the S20 is different than the Note 10, Note 10 Plus experience. Okay. And so how many days has it been? I switched on Sunday. So it'll be a week. It's been five days. Okay. Five days. Five days. And how's it going? It's going well. So my plan is to use a lot of different Android devices. I think that's one of the beauty of actually being on Android is you can switch and try everything, right? It's not just different sizes like you get with Apple. So I bought to replace my Apple Watch. I got really used to notifications on my wrist and I didn't want to give that up. So yeah. I bought Samsung's Galaxy Active 2 and I've okay. really been enjoying it. It's actually, I think, on par with the Apple Watch as far as UI and experience. Where it crushes the Apple Watch is battery life. Now, I don't have the LTE version, in all fairness, but at the end of the day, I have like 75% battery life left on the watch. So that's been awesome. That is not bad. I'm still experiencing some quirks with Android. You know, I had to sort of move most of my frequent contacts over to use Telegram instead of SMS to take myself out of iMessage. It wasn't a big deal. I, most people were on it anyway. I've been enjoying being on Android, sort of committing myself to stick with it. It's made it a lot easier. I am going to probably switch to a Pixel 4. Before I go to before I go to the S20, I don't think we're probably not going to get those devices. Doesn't seem for a while. I don't know. You know, we'll see after unpacked when they actually ship. You know, but the rumors are it won't be until like March. Yeah. So I want to try. You know, Google's version of Android. So I'm going to switch to uh, Pixel 4 XL for a little while. Might even pop a SIM in a uh, OnePlus 7 Pro or OnePlus 7T. Give that a whirl for a while. I'm going to be hopping around on phones for for, for quite a bit. <laughs> Interesting. Now, the Pixel 4, that is my, that was almost like my most disappointing phone so, of 2019. Yeah. I expected Google to kind of, I mean, you expect any manufacturer to kind of make forward progress, almost feature for feature each subsequent year as my Pixel 4 starts talking to me and answering me because I said the word Google. 
And I felt like they took a lot of steps back this year or just made some side steps. So I'm going to be curious to see what you think using it as a as a full time device. Yeah, you know, I agree. We did a review of the Pixel 4. I felt the same way. I think I felt the Pixel 4 itself was disappointing for battery life, especially the 4 XL yeah. was a bit better. So I'm going to try the XL and see if the experience has gotten better since that October launch with the uh, subsequent updates. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic to to give it a shot. I'm curious to see how sort of a stock Android device pairs with a Samsung ties and watch, see how that goes and mm-hmm. sort of keep sort of pushing through. What I am missing a lot is face ID. And that's kind of the reasons that I want oh. to go to the Pixel 4 to have the face unlock. Right. I found that I was using it a lot for third party app authentication, mm-hmm. especially for things like, you know, password management. Yes. And the ultrasonic fingerprint sensor on the Note 10 Plus, while novel and awesome and it's built into the screen, has not been working that well for me. So I'm constantly having to type in a super long master password to get yeah. to my password manager. And I, I found that to be annoying. Now, can you explain referring to the ultrasonic fingerprint reader as awesome and then your next statement being it doesn't work that well? So I think the technology is awesome. I think it's amazing that we can have a fingerprint reader built into the screen of a phone. And I think that in itself is fascinating and interesting. I don't know if I have weird thumbs, but really any fingerprint reader or weird fingerprints has never worked that well for me. Oh, really? On the back of the phone, the the front of the phone, the side of the phone. Interesting. It's never been that great. You know, whether it's Apple's Touch ID or the Android phones having it on the back, it's never been that great. So I may have like whatever narrow ridges on my thumb. So any fingerprint reader doesn't work that well, but especially the ultrasonic has especially not worked that well. Now, supposedly it's generation two from Qualcomm coming on the S20, which would be awesome Mm -hmm. and true. And maybe it'll be a better experience. I found the optical reader, the optical in-screen fingerprint reader on other phones, like the OnePlus line, actually works significantly better, you know, because it kind of lights up. So that one's actually worked very well for me. But I'm curious to try the Pixel just to get around the whole issue and just use their face unlock. Okay, cool. We're going to be following... As you know, I'm going to be asking you about this on a fairly regular basis because I'm very intrigued. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm probably changing phones about once a week or once every 10 days. So we'll we'll talk and we'll update. Uh, I don't think this is for a video. This is more just for, for my own kind of. In- yeah, for my for my own interest. Yeah. OK, so speaking of Android, let's talk about an upcoming Android device from OnePlus. The OnePlus 8 is on the way. Got it. And interestingly enough. They may finally be incorporating wireless charging into their devices. Yes. Speaking of OnePlus, that was a smooth transition. You've done that like a boss. So if you could say anything about OnePlus, you know, if you'd say maybe pick three points, yeah. like you get amazing value for the dollar, incredibly powerful, well specced phones. Yes. But they've been really reticent to add some necessary features, especially as their price points creep upwards. So really any significant IP rating, so some sort of kind of real True. waterproofing. And they switched to a glass back with the OnePlus 6 line, but they didn't add wireless charging. And they've been very adamant against wireless charging, saying it's not fast. But we got reports that OnePlus has joined, was it the WPC, the the wireless or WCP, the wireless charging consortium, (laughs) WC, uh, C, whatever it is. They joined it. And there's been a lot of rumors swirling that the OnePlus 8 will adopt wireless charging. Probably be a strange warp wireless version, but it'll probably be cheap compatible. I'm excited. I think that would be a reason for me to go to to OnePlus. I use wireless charging in my car all the time. It's how I charge my phone at night. That's almost a must have for me on any smartphone. Interesting. So for me, I find wireless charging to be like a nice to have, but not a necessary to have. But based on what you just said, I guess that really comes down to your behavior with your phone. If you're charging wirelessly at night in the car, then it's going to be essential for you to have wireless charging. Yeah, I mean, but but listen, you can, I, I can always plug it in in my car, too. It's not like I don't have a plug or a cable. I just find it extra convenient. So maybe it's not a have to have, like you said, but it's a really nice to to have that flexibility. Yes, especially at their price points like the cool thing about them has been if you've never heard of OnePlus before they make phones that are i would say 90% there when compared to maybe a flagship Samsung device for yeah you know 2 to 300 dollars less than the cost of that Samsung device so you get pretty much you know you get great features sometimes you get even better features like last year they had the 90 hertz display 
which Samsung didn't have, for example, but they'll keep things out like wireless charging. So you're saving money, but there are some features that either aren't going to be as good or just missing as a whole, wireless charging being one of them. And that's been the one that most people have kind of attacked them on, which is how are you going to call yourself a flagship killer, which is what they they used to use that term, flagship killer, if you're not even giving us what many consider to be these days, it's like a check the box feature. Like almost every new TV in 2020 is just going to be 4K. It's just a foregone conclusion. 4K displays are where we're at these days. Wireless charging is something that you just expect in a phone these days. It's interesting because OnePlus does leave features out, but they also go overboard on others, you know, especially when it comes to RAM, for example. Yes. Like I would imagine OnePlus is probably going to be the first manufacturer that gets to 32 gigabytes of RAM in a phone, right? It's crazy, oh my but God. they'll probably do it. And they'll probably do it with, imagine the, the OnePlus 8 Pro later on this year. No, like, you're right. I think it's coming soon. And that's insane. So they're out Samsunging, Sam, out Samsunging Samsung in a lot of ways, <laughs> but they're holding back on some things. And I guess that's part of their, you know, their cost strategy. And it's, it's interesting and it's certainly working because they're selling a lot of phones. Absolutely. And you said you're actually going to be trying out the OnePlus 7 Pro and or 7T in your Android, what I've been re- referring to as an Android experiment, but maybe yes. that's not really an accurate term. Your, your voyage no, nah, my it, I mean the Android Android experiment I think is fair. The voyage, the just keeping my mind open and keeping my my options flexible and giving me a better a better perspective on the mobile world. So yeah, and I think OnePlus is an important part of that. You know, I'll be trying all the brands like I said earlier. I'm going to try the LG V50. Uh, you know, just to give everything give everything a fair shake. For OnePlus Eight, I'm trying to see when we're expecting this to be released a march april ish seems to be the expected time Ah, okay so just uh just like two or three months away a spring a spring launch spring launch not that far not that far away at all okay well that's one plus eight that's an update on your android voyage if you will coming up after the break we're going to take a switch from android over to the apple side of the fence we've got a bunch of rumors and leaks as to what's coming in the next couple of months from Cupertino. It's coming up next on Geared Up. Big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring this week's episode of Geared Up. Travel tech can make you a master road warrior. You know what else puts you in control of your business trip? National Car Rentals Emerald Club. You can bypass the counter, choose any car on the aisle, and go. It feels good to be in the driver's seat, doesn't it? Go national, go like a pro. Subject to availability and other restrictions. Welcome back to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental Story of the Week. As you know, Geared Up is sponsored by National Car Rental. And if you don't know, I also do a show with National Car Rental on YouTube called Technically Speaking, where I bring you the latest, my picks for the best tech for business travel. Whether you're business traveling or even whether you're going for leisure travel, there's a lot of tech out there that can make your travel more efficient or even more fun. You can check these episodes out at the nationalcar.com control center or go to youtube.com slash national car rent. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. And once again, big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. All right, John, there are a lot of things coming from Apple seemingly this spring, which taking a look at the list, it looks like for the most part, pretty much all of this you can use while still being an Android user. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's a lot of there's a lot of things coming. So, yes, let's talk about these. So Apple will typically have a spring event or not, maybe not an event, but they usually have a spring season of releases. So sometimes it's done via press release. Sometimes it's done in conjunction with an Apple special event presentation, a keynote, etc. We're not sure what this is going to be for these because everything on this list seems to be. Something that can be released without a lot of fanfare. But you tell me if you disagree. Okay, fire away. So let's get started with, this is interesting, an Apple wireless charging Sounds pad. Sounds familiar, right? Which is not AirPower. What do you think they're going to call this thing? Are they going to bring back the AirPower name? <laughs> mm, that's a good question. They're going to call it the Apple 
wireless charging mat. I think it would be a huge miss opportunity if they didn't call it Apple Juice. Oh, I'm just saying Apple I think juice. Apple Juice is a perfect name. Have some fun <laughs> with it. Uh, if you don't call it Air Power, Apple Juice. I'm here to buy some Apple Juice. <laughs> OK, now a wireless charging pad. I'm going to assume that actually, you know, I don't even know if I can assume this. I was going to say I'm going to assume it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be what Air Power was, which was that kind of elongated oval that allows you to place multiple Apple watches or phones anywhere that you want to get them charging. I was going to say this is probably going to be something where you can place, you know, one phone or one watch on there. However, the watch is not a Qi compatible device, which would imply that to make a pad that can support both a phone and a watch would be more engineering than maybe they'd want to do. Interesting. I don't know. So here's my thought on that. And I think you're wrong. I think Apple, there's no way Apple in what, 2018 can announce air power, obviously never shipped. And uh-huh. eventually in 2020, ship something that does less than what they announced with air power. Wait, so you think it's going to be either equal to or better than what they announced in Correct. 2018? Yep. I think it has to be. I think they either fix air power, they're actually going to release it, uh. or it'll be something that will be better and improved upon what air power was going to be. And actually, the Apple Watch is a cheap compatible charger. It just needs a magnet to make that cheap power flow. Mm. Okay. Interesting. So you're expecting... I'm expecting air power, perhaps by a different name, but essentially air power in function. Which would mean it'll charge any wirelessly chargeable Apple device just by placing it on there. Or any Qi device, right. but it'll talk to your Apple right. devices. You, know, you put your phone on, you'll see all the you know cool animations. That's what I would expect if Apple does indeed release a wireless charger. I can't see a world where that doesn't happen. Interesting. Now, see, now you've got me excited. I hope you're right, but... <laughs> I can also see a world where Apple says, you know what? We want to release all of our phones currently and our watches do wireless charging. Let's just release something small that people can buy that's Apple branded when they're looking for something to charge their devices with. We have something for them in the store. And other than that, it's not a big deal, but we'll see. I mean, both are probable, but I, I'm towing the line that I think Apple's got something big and that they solved the air power problem. I hope you're right. If they did, that would be big. And dare I say, if they did, that would warrant an event. I think so. Okay. Next. It's not just the wireless charging mat. There's several devices here. Next up. But wait, there's more. Yes. AirTag. AirTag being a device that your iPhone can locate with pinpoint accuracy. So think of it as GPS, which people say can locate you to within 30 feet This would be something that can locate a device within, say, 30 inches. So very, very precisely. Yeah, this is kind of the less exciting product. I think this is scheduled to come out during the holidays and just didn't. It's tags. It's geolocation tags just done with Apple with the fancy UI. Wow. That's all it is to you? I don't think that's all this is to you. It's not that exciting, right? It's it's tile. We've seen this before. It is. Yeah. So if you're unaware, (laughs) this is something similar to another company called Tile, which makes their little, I actually have one right here. It's about one and a half inches square and you put it in a bag or for me, I put them in my different suitcases. And if by some reason whatever you have the tile in or attached to. So some people put them in their wallet, for example. If you lose it, you can go into an app on your phone and locate the exact location of where the tile is, which would then tell you where that thing is, wherever you attach the tile to. You can then make the tile make a noise from your phone, so you can kind of follow a noise if you're nearby, etc. Apple is making their own version of this, which would work with the ultra-wideband chip inside of the latest iPhones, so it'll all be built into iOS. And I don't know. I think it's it is something that's not like overly exciting, but it's also something that if you need it and you have it, it can be a lifesaver. It's absolutely useful. I just don't think it's exciting necessarily, but it's certainly a useful product. And if Apple prices it right, I think they will sell a lot of them. How do you think they're pricing this? Do you think it's going to just be you buy one and you're good to go? Or do you think it'll be a service? I think they'll sell one. And they'll sell them in packs of three and probably packs of five. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine that it'll probably come with the service mm. uh, included, okay. at least initially. And then maybe they'll do, you know, they'll do a subscription plan after that. That's what I was thinking as well. All right. Next up, next in the bundle is a very vague high end headphones. Yes. So we've got 
AirPods, which is Apple's wireless earbuds. We've got AirPods Pro, which are the high-end wireless earbuds. Now we're talking about high-end headphones, which unlike earbuds would be something that go on or over your ears, which is interesting because Apple owns Beats, which does high-end headphones, at least Apple proclaims them to be. But these would be Apple branded and not Beats branded. Yes. So I want to ask the same question. What do you think they call these? Ooh, I mean, AirPods Pro is taken. Hmm. It can't be headphones. I don't know. I don't know. I actually don't know. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Is it like Air Cans? Air, oh, God. That, that'd be terrible. Air Beats? Beats Air? Like, what are they going to call this Well, it's thing? not going to be Beats. They're not, you can't call it Beats. If you put Beats in there, then I don't know. it should be a Beats product. But this is not going to be a Beats product. Yeah, I legitimately have no idea what they're going to call this thing. Headphones Pro. Just Headphones Pro? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that sounds it's so just, plain it's just and terrible. <laughs> but... These would be something that would likely compete at the top of the line with Bose and Sony using Apple. I assume that the AirPods Pro was kind of a teaser as to what we'd see in something bigger, which would be, you know, it would have the transparency mode. It would have what I've been calling like it's like AR for your ears because transparency mode isn't actually just turning down the noise cancellation. It's actually keeping noise cancellation going, but then layering in outside sound through it. So if Apple can take what we're seeing in the AirPods Pro and give us an even better version on over ear headphones, that could be very nice. I'm very curious to see what they do. Uh, I've been very impressed with Apple's headphones. I think they've given more space and more room for battery. They could probably use some pretty awesome things. Do you use over ears or on ears or are you more of a earbud guy? I used to use over ears. I mean, I used to be a Bose guy and then I was a Sony guy. But since I started using the AirPods Pro, that's mostly what I've been using. I mean, for this amazing for airplanes, I've been really right. happy with it. Would you switch or, you know, the thing with me is as exciting as this sounds, if you're an audiophile, I feel like the convenience of AirPods Pro, it's just in my pocket. Every It's just there. Always there. I don't have to worry to put it in my bag. I don't have to worry about charging them. Like every day when I take up, when I charge my phone at night, I also put my AirPods on a wireless charger. So they're just always fully charged. And then in the morning, I grab my wallet, grab my phone, grab my AirPods, and I'm good. So it just seems like for me, convenience is now trumping something that may be better because I'm not saying that AirPods Pro are the best headphones in the world, but they are certainly the most convenient and they're always just there. They really are. They're just easy. Like just, they're just easy to use. Do you switch to, if Apple releases a a pair of headphones that legitimately impress you, Okay. do you think you're able to make the switch or do you think it's like, cool, maybe I'll even get some, but eventually I just fall back into AirPods because I think that's the camp I'm in. Yeah, I think I'm in that camp too. I was trying to try it because it's interesting, but the AirPods are so convenient. They don't take up a lot of space in my bag. You know, I'm doing a day trip to San Francisco or a day trip somewhere. That's not that's not taking up my whole backpack. It's so easy and so simple. Mm-hmm. It'd be hard to not just jump on it. I'm with you. Okay, next product. This is an interesting one. Apple will likely be releasing an iPhone 9. Weird. I think iPhone SE 2 is probably more likely. Mm, I disagree. I disagree. Okay. iPhone SE is so many years old that it's like forgotten about by the general general public. So calling it an SE 2, half the people would be like, what was even SE 1? What is this? I mean, so maybe, so, isn't that like a four-year-old phone? So maybe they called something else. You know, they had the 5C, then they had the SE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe for it's sure. the whatever, iPhone QT76A. Um, <laughs> right, right. But in the rumor here, and, and if you're the kind of person that really likes the iPhone 8 body, but also really wishes it had iPhone 11 specs inside of it, you're going to be in luck. That's pretty much what this phone is going to be. Right. So you want something that is fast, modern, has all the features basically, or the internal features basically of an iPhone 11, but you don't want such a big phone. Apple is going to go back and basically release the best version of the previous design. The last generation with Touch ID. Right, so they've basically refined, refined, refined. This is gonna be the fifth version of that design. So basically it's been refined over years since the iPhone 6, and this will be the ultimate version of an iPhone with a button. And there are still people out there who refuse to buy an iPhone 11, iPhone 10s, 10, because they're comfortable with 
the home button and they don't want to give it up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a lot of things where a lot of people go. My dad was the same way. And then I gave an iPhone 10 and now he can't imagine not having a face ID. But listen, if this comes in at a lower price point, if Apple actually releases it at 128 gigs of opening storage instead of 64, which is yeah. asinine, they will sell a lot of these phones. For a lot of people, it's just a price game. What's the cheapest new iPhone I can get? This is it. I'm in. Right. And I think there's also a big segment of people out there who kind of going off of what you just said, they just want a new iPhone and not necessarily new features. Like I know so many people personally who will buy a new phone and I'll be like, oh, you got the new iPhone. What did you, you know, what, what did you like about it? Or what did you and like? Oh, I just wanted a new phone. I just wanted the new phone. Like they don't even know what the new phone can do compared to their old one. They just want the new phone. Yeah. I'll take the new iPhone. Right. So I think there is a legitimate amount of people out there who will say, you know, I want the new phone. I don't want to spend too much. Oh, this is the newest and cheapest phone. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take that. I don't care if it's LCD. I don't care if there's a button on there. I don't care. Like it looks like all the other iPhones I've owned. Yeah, I agree. And I think they'll sell a lot of them. I don't know if they'll sell as many as some of the other ones, but it's interesting, I think. And it opens up a new market for Apple. I agree. Okay. Second to last product. This is probably the one I'm most excited about. New updated iPad Pro. Are you excited about it? I love my iPad Pro. I love my iPad Pro. I use it every day. It's probably my favorite piece of tech, but I'm not that excited about a new one because this one is so good. So I think that's my thing. So my view on that is this product is so good. How are they going to make it better? And they're going to show me how they've made it better. And it's going to be even better than this one that's already so good. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. I love the design. I love the thinness. I love the weight. I want to see what they're going to do above. You know, the big rumor is it's going to have a similar camera module to the iPhone 11 Pro, which is the three camera system on the iPad. But aside from that, what are you going to do to make it faster? How are you going to take advantage of those cameras? Like what's going to be special about this versus the previous generation? And iPad Pros only come along every year and a half, which is an interesting cadence. So... We currently have the newest iPad Pro, which from 2018, 2019 saw nothing. And so we're going to get basically a two processor generation leap because it's skipping the last gen processor and going to the next one. So, yeah, I'm just genuinely curious what they're going to do to make the iPad even better than it already is. And it's already great. And it's already, I think, the best product. And I would say the best product Apple's ever made. I use my 2018 iPad Pro nonstop Mm. all the time, and it's still amazingly powerful The only way I could see them persuading people to upgrade. No one's buying the iPads for the updated camera. And I think very few are going to buy it for the updated processor because the last gen is still so fast. Sure. If the new specs of the 2020 iPad Pro unlock somehow new software features with the new version of iPad OS, like you only get a redesigned Mm -hmm. home screen if you've got Mm -hmm. the latest processor. That's the only way I can see people wanting to upgrade. Yeah, and the other thing with iPads though, I think I'm more in a a definite niche. Like I think the reason that people don't like, uh, like Wall Street doesn't like iPad sales numbers is because iPads are not a device that you upgrade every time a new one comes out. You buy an iPad and you basically use it until it doesn't do what you're used to it doing or it doesn't do something new that you needed to do. iPads last a long time. And the iPad Pros that we currently have, if we weren't in this business and we weren't tech enthusiasts, we could probably use that device for another two to three years and it would be totally fine. Yeah. So I don't know that Apple's making an iPad Pro to convince people of last year's iPad Pro to upgrade. But maybe if you have the iPad Pro from before that, I mean, you know, the 10.5, this might be something to upgrade to. But we'll see. That's what I'm saying. Also, about. like the iPad line is like, it's just like a disaster right now. It's like the MacBook line was a couple <laughs> years ago. You've got the That's iPad true. mini, the entry level iPad, which is a killer value. Then you've got randomly yes. the iPad Air still in there and then the right. iPad Pro. So I, I think this year, in addition to an updated iPad Pro, they're also going to streamline the iPad line. I imagine we, the iPad Air will go away. We'll have just an iPad mini will go away. We'll have just an iPad and an iPad Pro and the line will actually make sense again. No, the mini can't go. Away. You need the mini. You need the mini. The, the phones are almost exactly the same size. Uh, I think it is unnecessary now to have the mini. Uh, listen, I stand by that. I firmly believe if you were going to call any device an iPad without any other 
moniker air pro whatever just ipad okay. the ipad mini deserves that name the ipad mini is the one true ipad and if there was an ipad mini pro i would be all over that and that would be the only ipad i'd own i mean just for nostalgia's sake apple's not one to hold on to devices for nostalgia i mean they killed the ipod i think the ipad mini while amazing in its day and when it made sense makes very little sense now children I'm not a child, but, <laughs> yeah, but the, I, the regular the regular iPad is so cheap. That's true. It's actually cheaper than the iPad mini. Yes. I mean, like why? I don't understand why anybody <laughs> would buy an iPad mini. The iPad mini has a better display than the entry level laminated. It's small because it's smaller. You can hide What's laminated, crap though? You're, you're arguing for dead. Device. You're arguing like in favor of newspapers. You're arguing in favor of taxi cabs. I think the iPad mini is the most convenient form factor for a tablet out there. From any company. Listen, you are allowed to have your opinion, but you're also allowed to have your your opinion be wrong. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. We <laughs> want to hear from you out there if you use an iPad. I don't think many people use an iPad Mini, unfortunately. But if you do, iPad Mini lovers, let us hear from you. Hit us up. iPad Mini lovers. Yeah, that's right. That's a good way. Gets a good way to phrase it. <laughs> All right. Last device rumored for Apple to release in the spring. A new 13 or 14, we're not sure, new MacBook Pro, a smaller MacBook Pro, and new MacBook Air, with likely the main feature being they're adopting the new scissor keyboard switches that the 16-inch MacBook Pro got a couple Correct. months ago. I'm game. So I don't think you can be any surprises with the MacBook Pro. It's going to be a smaller version. Yeah. But what I think would be a huge surprise for Apple... If they somehow release a version of this new 14-inch MacBook Pro that had a dedicated GPU option. Oh, right, because they don't do that with the 13-inch. They inch. don't There's do no that. Way. Imagine, yeah. imagine that. Maybe a little extra room in that chassis, dedicated GPU option that you can add in there. Then you've got a little powerhouse to carry with you. You just don't want the bigger screen size. That's right. A little video editing powerhouse. That would be good. That would be a bad mamma jamma. But that is one way they get you to buy the 15 or 16-inch, though. So would they give that up? I don't know. I mean, I don't think Apple's always been one to cannibalize themselves. I think they've always that's said, true. like, let's just sell something as long as it's ours. Right. That's why they made the iPad mini. Yeah. So <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, so I think it would make sense for them to do it. It would be interesting to see what they actually end up doing. So that is it. We got wireless charging mat, AirTag, high end headphones, iPhone yes. 9 or SE2, new iPad Pro, new MacBook Pro, new MacBook Air. Your prediction, do we see an Apple event or do we just get a week of press releases? Honestly, I think a week of press releases. Mm, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, I think that's generally what it is. Let's move on to our next topic. Something that you and I have been talking about on Twitter with some other people is an Apple TV Plus show called Servant. <laughs> we have. This one kind of came about randomly. Yes. We've, been, we've both been watching it and enjoyed it during its first season run. And before anybody clicks away... We will not give any spoilers here no at spoilers. all for the show. So I figured since this is a tech show, we talk about some of the tech, but we have to also just talk about this show for a little bit because it is compelling. And when you say no spoilers, I'm sure we can talk about what's in the like the teaser trailer. Yeah. So if, if it's in the teaser watch. trailer for the show, we can talk about. And I guess we could probably explain the general premise of the show is there's this family that has a baby. Some sort of events, the baby passes away and the mother goes into denial and the family, the husband replaces the baby with a doll and the mother sort of thinks the doll is a real baby. And the story kind of goes through and, and tells what happens with the mother, the father, the doll and a new nanny who comes in to try to keep the facade alive. Yes. And so with the show being called Servant, it kind of focuses a little bit towards the new nanny and yeah her behavior very interesting show i personally and i know a lot of people feel the opposite i've actually always been a big fan of m night Shyamalan, just in general i pretty much like all of his movies even the ones that people hate even the one about the trees even the village uh, yes i actually like the village but the one even where like the, the trees village. were trying to kill people wait i thought that was the village no the village was the one where it was like the people lived in the village and they kept everybody there and then the big reveal spoiler for the village was that they were sort of in modern times right that's the trees though what, what, is there a different tree no, one there was a oh, movie with mark Wahlberg where like the yes. trees try to kill people yeah <laughs> i like that one too yeah. <laughs> i like that one too yes the only movie of his i didn't see was the last airbender which just seemed like a that was like a 
totally different. It wasn't really like his movie. It was more he was directing something else. But this movie, if you're into that kind of dark drama, suspense, I wouldn't call this a horror movie. It's just like a very suspenseful. You're always on the edge of your seat at the end of each episode. You're like, what did I just watch? What is happening? Who else watched this? Because I need to talk about this immediately. If you like that, Servant is a good show to watch. Yeah, agreed. I loved the show. If they're half hour, it's easily digestible. Right. This is not a sponsor thing. We just both really like the show. Yeah, for sure. Let me ask you this. So obviously you're watching this show. I'm watching the show as part of our free one year trial of Apple TV Plus, which unfortunately today's the last day to start your one year free trial of Apple TV Plus. And I say unfortunately because you're not going to hear this episode until two or three days after we record it. So it'll be too late for you by the time you hear this. So hopefully if you bought any Apple hardware in the past three months, you started your one year free trial. But my question for you, has Apple TV plus done, and obviously it still has another nine months or so to get you to this point, but in the first three months, has it done enough to get you to the point where you would even consider paying $4 and 99 cents per month to access it? I don't think so. Honestly, I think I would. The trial has been awesome. If it ended today and I couldn't watch anymore, I'd probably be fine with it. I really liked Servant. I thought it was an amazing show, but I pay for enough services that I don't use. I'm not going to add one more. Yeah, I am on the fence. So I'm not I'm not as like a hard no, but I'm more. Let me see what you add. So if you basically they need to get me to the point where I've seen enough season one shows that I've really enjoyed and that I want to see what happens in season two for me to give them my money. And, you know, one thing that's nice about streaming services is that they're very easy, or at least what Apple does, like they make it very easy to start and stop. So for example, let's say Servant came back for season two and you wanted to watch it. You have two options. You can say, I already subscribe, or you have three options. I already subscribe, so I'm just gonna see it when it comes. You can say option two, I'll pay once it starts and I'll end it 10 weeks later when it ends. And your third option is you can wait till it ends, sign up, binge watch the 10 and cancel and just pay $5 to access that whole season of content. And this obviously doesn't just apply to Apple. This is, I think, a smarter strategy as we're going into all these different streaming services that are happening. There's no need to just pay for everything on a monthly basis. You can pick and choose. What shows do you like? When do you want to watch them? Are you willing to binge and wait? You can save yourself a lot of money. You can save yourself a lot of money. I, I this is, A lot of my money goes out the window to streaming services, and I don't watch that <laughs> much shows. The reason right. I like Servant is because it's a half hour. I'm like, yeah. I can spare a half hour. I won't really want to watch the morning show, but I don't necessarily have the time you know, with mm. kids to sit there and watch an hour show and commit right. to it. So something like Servant was awesome. I don't know. I probably would bite the bullet and pay for it, but it'd probably be begrudgingly and I'd forget about it and then remember it and cancel it. <laughs> Let's talk about these streaming services for a moment. We had a uh, okay. Q4 streaming services, U.S. customer base, according to Wall Street Journal that came out. And I just thought it was interesting. Now, this list does not mean any of these or there's no implication, I think, or extrapolation that any of these are better than anything else. It's just here's where the landscape stands at the end of 2019. Okay. And also do note that Disney Plus had basically just launched as a couple weeks prior to the end of that 2019. So top five streaming services. Number one, Netflix, 61.3 million paying customers in the US. So these are US numbers, does not count anything yeah, that's outside crazy. of the US. 61.3 million people, that's, <laughs> that's nuts. Netflix definitely sits at the top of the throne. Next, this one's interesting to me because Are people paying for the video or are they paying for something else? And they just happen to be counted in the video. That would be Amazon Prime. 42.2 million customers. Yeah, that's that's such a fair question. Like, what are they counting as a customer? It's anyone who's an Amazon Prime member because they have access to Amazon Prime video. However, some people sign up for Amazon Prime just to get one day shipping for free and they never open Amazon Prime video or even know it exists. Yeah, I think a lot of people. I still literally to this day find people who all say, oh, you use Amazon Prime. Do you do you watch anything on Prime Video? Oh, what's Prime Video? What's that? Like, they don't even know. <laughs> yeah. They don't know. Come about Prime on, music. people. 
Yes. So yes, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you have access to Amazon Prime Video, Amazon Prime Music, several services in addition to free fast shipping. But nevertheless, 42.2 million people in the United States pay Amazon and have access to Amazon Prime Video. Next, third place, which may be a surprise to some, Apple TV Plus. Apple TV Plus, third place, 33.6 million subscribers. Now, This is a combination of paying subscribers and people who have the free one year subscription, but not everybody who subscribes has a free subscription. Some people are paying $5 a month. We don't know the difference between the two, though. But in total, 33.6 million Apple TV Plus third place just a couple months after launching as a streaming service. Just shows how many people have iPhones, right? (laughs) iPhones, iPads, Apple TVs. That number, I think, was most surprising to me just because to come out of the gate at number three and be beating number four, which is Hulu, which has been around for years. I think Hulu is like 14 years old or 13 years old. 31.8 million Apple TV Plus is beating them by almost 2 million subscribers. And that number is only going to grow the more phones and iPads that they sell over the next year if they continue the trial. Right. Well, the trial is ending today, which means if you buy a new iPhone 11 a week from now, you don't get a free trial anymore. So I bet they, I bet they back on backtrack on that. But that is that oh, is really? true okay. as of this recording. Yes. That is a true story. And then fifth place out of every streaming service, Disney Plus at twenty three point two million. Another new player on the block. Yes. So in the top five, you've got. Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu, which have been around for years, all three of them, and then Apple TV Plus and Disney Plus, which just broke through and forced themselves into the top five just over the past, you know, couple of months. Yeah. What do you see happening here? Do you see Disney or Apple overtaking Netflix in the next year or two? Or do you think Netflix kind of sits at the top for a while? I think Apple's strategy is going to be interesting. Obviously, Apple needs to start charging for this at some point. They extend the free trial into the next generation of devices. So whatever iPhone 12s or whatever comes next, I can see them growing significantly. And then as season two of shows start to come out, people get more excited. I don't think they're going to catch Netflix. Who I think might catch Netflix, though, is Disney Plus. Mm. Once the Marvel shows start hitting, once season two of Mandalorian comes out, there's so much buzz from season one. Right. I think they have the content, the money, and the chops to be the first company to really give Netflix a run for their money. I think Apple's big problem is no IP, no established properties, right? Right. They're making their own. Servants new. Morning shows new. Everything is new right now. I mean, Disney's right. got Star Wars, Marvel. I mean, they, there's so much Pixar. IP there that they have. They also have Pixar as another option, as another piece of IP, very popular with adults and children. I'm curious to see what these numbers look like at the end of Q1 2020. Yeah, as am I. And I think that's going to be interesting to see. But Disney's got money to burn and they're all in on this. They're they're pot committed to making Disney Plus a success. It will be curious to see what happens. All right, let's move on. Final segment of the show. We asked for questions today. Q&A. Q and A. If you've got Qs, we've got we've got the A. We've got the A. Q and A for J and A here. <laughs> Let's get started. First question that came in. Do you believe? And actually, I don't even know why I didn't note down who asked these questions. That's my uh, fault. Andrew, to fail. That is a yeah, you you know what? You're right. So much so that I'm gonna go back and look. Okay, here we go. Miguel at Mike the Real on Twitter asks, that's more professional. Do you believe Apple will create a phone carrier service similar to Google Fi? So uh, that's a question. No, no is the easy answer. I do not. I also do not. If you're not aware, Google Fi is a phone service that Google runs, which you can sign up for. I actually think it's the best deal in mobile carriers if you're a US based customer. It piggybacks on T-Mobile and Sprint. So as you're moving around, it picks the best signal between the two. And Mm -hmm. that's your carrier until you move to a stronger tower. One low price. And it seems to be the only carrier that is completely impossible to SIM swap from, to get SIM hacked through. 
So it's a great value. It's cool that Google does it for their customers, but I don't see Apple doing something similar. Although they are more and more into services, so can't rule it out, but I don't see it happening for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I don't see it happening either. I think obviously it's possible they could do it. It seems incredibly unlikely and unprobable that it would happen. And they'd have to be piggybacking on one of these carriers anyway, you know, like Google Fi. So they're not going to launch their own network at this point. So I just don't see it happening. Okay, next next question from Professor Zoom. What's the plan regarding your channels and their future? Where Mm. do you want your companies to be? Do you have specific plans in place? Do you want to expand into different areas? That's a big one. Andrew, why don't you take that one first? Okay, let's see. Regarding channel future, you know, for me, I don't necessarily look at my channel as my business. I look at my channel as a part of my business, for sure, and as a big part of my business. But when I think of my future, I don't necessarily think of my channel's future. I think of more of the future as a, of the business as a whole. And for me, that means being in as many places as I can to serve the users and viewers of different platforms where they are. So what I mean by that is just my personal opinion. If you're on Facebook, it's more annoying for me to say, hey, come on and click over to YouTube and watch this thing I made while you're on Facebook. And if you're on Facebook, that's, you're there because you want to be there. Then it is for me to say, hey, you're on Facebook. Here's the full video to enjoy here on Facebook. I'm respecting you where you are rather than trying to rip you out and bring you to somewhere else for my personal needs. And so growth for me looks like probably doing the thing I've avoided for years and starting to bring in a team of some sorts, one or two people to help me with things that I can get off my plate so I can focus more on the things that I am really good at and have other people help me with the things that I may not be as good at so that we have a more efficient workflow. That would be my short answer for getting my company into the future. No, that's a fair answer. And I admire your approach, your multi-pronged approach for being in a lot of different places. Since the Techno Buffalo sale, I have kind of a different approach. I'm the breadth of my business is mostly online and mostly on on YouTube. So I'm I'm admittedly now less diversified than I used to be and certainly less diversified than you are. Something that I want to work on. But 2019 was a big year for me. And 2019 was the year I shed Techno Buffalo and kind of focused on video full time for the first time in a very, very, very long time. So I plan on continuing that. I plan on sort of learning where I fit in in the tech space too. You know, I think it's it's always changing. New faces are coming in. And that mm-hmm. was one of the most enjoyable parts for me of 2019 was sort of relearning just on video where I was in the space and what I could do that was different than others were doing. So I'm looking forward to more storytelling in 2020, more sharing opinions and perspectives Mm -hmm. on the technology and how it's impacted my life and could impact your life, getting more cinematic with the videos and doing sort of some more bigger flagship productions are things that I'm excited about in 2020. And one of the big fallacies of modern YouTube is the subscriber count. The subscriber count doesn't matter anymore. It's a It's a vanity number mostly. And certainly the more subscribers is better. It's better for advertisers, I guess. But as far as YouTube proper is concerned and who they show those videos to, it's all about the homepage. Mm -hmm. So I'm less focused on a subscriber number and more on what I can do algorithmically to get my videos on that homepage more. Try to learn the algorithm better so I can get my videos in front of more people's eyes, at least give it more chance for success. That's really what it's all about. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. If you want to be successful in this line of work, which is video making, not even tech video making, but just video making Mm -hmm. online as a whole, you really need to shed the idea of what does my follower or subscriber count look like and focus more on how do I grow my business and how do I, you know, what are the tactics I need to grow a successful business? Two that you just named are I need my videos to be seen. I need people to be exposed to my content in order for them to watch my content and get to know me and grow with me and become a fan possibly. So that's my biggest piece of advice to anybody. For some reason, I don't know, it came really easy to me to not care about subscriber numbers, but it seems to be a really difficult one for a lot of people to kind of let that go. Yeah, it's, it's a vanity part of it, right? It's validation for what you're doing. 
but the views are, I think what matters more. So that's, yeah. that's sort of where my focus is going to be this year. I agree. At spark camera on Instagram asked, how do you make your videos? Awesome. Huh? And, and I, uh, I believe I, this is asking about, do you have like specific techniques or, you know, that you do to make your videos look good? I mean, I always like the videos and think of what I could have done differently if I just had more time. Mm. Um, so I think they can always be better and they could always add more awesome. I just want them to be visually appealing. I really just I want to keep making my videos be visually appealing and sort of have more fun with the intros of the video. So that's uh, that's what I'm going to keep sort of working on or the intros and kind of get people hooked on the video early. And for me, I mean, this this either was going to be surprising or it's going to be like, yeah, I know. But I don't consider myself to be great at making videos. <laughs> I consider myself I can, I can be great on camera talking about a subject, but I don't know that I am great at taking a camera and getting the most out of what that camera can do from a visual perspective. I don't think I have like a design eye either. So like, even if it wasn't about the camera, if someone was just like, Hey, here's an empty room with some furniture and some props, go to town and make it look great for as a set. I I wouldn't know where to start. So that's kind of where I was saying, I I think I need, you know, people who have skills that I'm lacking that would definitely be one, someone who can, you know, do magic behind a camera, someone who knows how to make things look good through a lens so that I can do what I'm good at, which is just standing in front of the camera and, you know, trying to educate a viewer. Fair. That might be all the questions. I'm double checking right now. Well, there is one other one, and I think this might be for you, or there's two now, and they're kind of, they're kind of on the same vein, so I'm just going to hit you with both of them. First of all, are you going to Staples tonight? And second of all, when is the sneaker video dropping? Huh. I wish I could go to Staples tonight. I will absolutely be watching the game tonight for the yeah. tribute to Kobe Bryant. Yes. And to see how the players are going to react to the tragedy. And as far as the sneaker video, I don't know. I've been getting into the sneaker game. I think, Andrew, your collection's a little more probably impressive than mine. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I don't know. Maybe on Instagram, people want to see it. We'll do it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Like yeah. there's some, there's definitely some videos that I do nowadays, again, trying to take my whole multi pronged approach where not everything's about YouTube, where I actually do videos sometimes that just go on Instagram because I feel like that's a more appropriate place than YouTube yeah. would be. And I mean, I definitely want to see what your collection looks like, but I also agree that it would be fairly out of place for you to just drop that on your YouTube channel. Agreed. But if you drop it on IG- IGTV, I'd be watching. Yeah, you know, I, I think that would make sense. I've talked to some of the sneaker YouTubers, too, about maybe doing a collab with them and they'll do a video on their channel and my collection. But we'll see. At some point, I think in 2020, we'll, we'll show it on show it on TV. There you go. Well, hey, that's this episode of Geared Up. You got a little bit of a longer episode than we usually even do. A little extra we sauce. Today. There you go. And with that, we can go right into the pre-recorded outro and we're good. Woo! And that is it for this edition of Geared Up. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can catch John and I on YouTube. I'm at youtube.com slash gear live. And John is at youtube.com slash John for Lakers. Feel free to head over and subscribe to our channels to stay up to date on all the latest tech. Speaking of subscribing, you can subscribe to Geared Up in your favorite podcast app if you haven't done so already. Just search Geared Up. That's two words, not one in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Overcast, or really wherever you choose to listen. If you like what we do, please consider leaving us a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Geared Up is a Gear Live podcast, and you can see more from us at GearLive.com. Thank you so much for listening. For John Rettinger, I'm Andrew Edwards, and we'll catch you in the next episode.